Welcome to the Grace Story Podcast, where we introduce you to interesting people and their inspiring stories. From Grace professors, current students, and distinguished alumni, to special guests and speakers on our campus, you can meet new people and hear how they are impacting the world around them. This podcast is recorded and produced at Grace College and Seminary, located on the shores of Winona Lake in the great state of Indiana. This is the Grace Story Podcast. Today, we are interviewing Pastor Tim Sprankle, who has served as the lead pastor of Leesburg Grace Church for the past 16 years. He's a Lancer at heart, two-time Grace alum, both undergraduate and seminary, and recently completed his doctoral program with a dissertation titled, Rediscovering God Talk, Congregational Formation Through Sharing Testimonies. In addition to his pastoring, Tim adjunct teaches at Grace College, serves as a cross-country coach for the Lincoln Lions, and has written some commentaries and currently working on one right now. He enjoys disc golf, reading, and loves his wife Liz, three kids, Claire, Margo, and Cincy. Tim, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Drew. I'm, feel- exci- I'm excited about this one. It's like this is, we, we don't have a conversation that's not usually at Starbucks at 6 in the morning. I know, and I usually do a lot of the que- Oh, no, you're really good at going back and forth, but I ask questions, and now I'm getting to answer questions, so it's a different seat for me. This brings me great joy to be able to quiz you I'm and in the dig hot seat. in in the hot seat. So, well, let's start with this. This is the Grace Story podcast, so just tell us a little bit about kind of background how you got to Grace, and then how you got to Leesburg Grace. Sure. Well, I came to Grace because I made this bold proclamation my senior year of high school when I was already enrolled early at Miami of Ohio because I'm from Columbus, Ohio. And I was going to be an engineer because I knew they made good money. I didn't know what they did. I didn't know there were many types of it. But my brother went to Miami. I was going to go to Miami. And then on this fateful night when I was doing a French project my senior year, all of us were talking about, where are you going to school? What are you going to do? And I go, well, I'm going to Miami to be an engineer, but I don't actually know what that is, and I'd rather be a youth (laughs) pastor. And it's the first time I ever said anything like that out loud. And I was like, what did I just say? (laughs) Because I'd been doing Bible studies in Uh my high school for years and loved teaching, loved spending time in the Word. And it just so happened I had a friend who was a year older than I was who was going to Grace at the time, and he was bragging on grace. He says, you got to come here. He actually literally told me in a phone conversation one time, if you don't come to Grace College, you might lose your salvation. Oh, wow. That's that's a new tactic. They may have uh, helped his theology a a little later by the sophomore (laughs) year, but I got freshman theology there. And I was like, I don't want to lose my salvation. Oh, my goodness. And I want to be a youth pastor. And uh, so I told my parents, Grace had just started their youth ministry program that same year I was looking to go in. That felt very providential. Um, I had a certain amount of money that I needed between what I already had and what I needed to go to school. So we called Grace, and they were very helpful with mm. financial aid. It was just the right amount. So that wow. felt very providential, too. And and so at that point, it was like, hey, this this seems to be the place for me. So that's how I landed at Grace. And then you, you, uh, you ran cross-country at Grace, and then also um, your ministry career, that's, that is the path you ended up on, right? Yes, it is. So I started as a youth ministry major. As I got more and more into my biblical study classes, I thought, I don't know that, not that this is what youth ministry is. I don't know what I, that I want to organize games for kids my whole life. I love studying the Bible. I love the theology. I love the backgrounds. I want to I want to teach like thick theology is kind of what I was thinking. Mm. So I moved to a ministry major, biblical studies major, Greek minor. And in the meantime, I was involved in a lot of things at Grace. I was an RA. I was a growth group leader. I was running cross-country, which was a funny story because I didn't run cross-country prior to coming to Grace. Oh, really? But Grace requires you to do like a physical ed class or whatever they called it. So I took jogging fitness in between the opening day of class where we did a pre-test and the last day of class where we did a post-test, I ended up beating two cross-country runners in the class. And they were like, do you run cross-country? I was like, no. They were like, you should come out for the team. Wow. So that's that was like my entry into running. I always had good endurance. I just didn't know there was a sport behind it or a, an athlete in me. And so my sophomore year is when I started doing cross-country. It's also when I met my 
wife to be Liz. We met through theater here at Grace. We were both in theater. She was in a play. They didn't have enough guys. I came to the first practice and I saw her on the stage and I was like, I think I'll do this play. <laughs> and so we started dating by the end of the play. And uh, th- that was my time at Grace. I went straight into seminary. And um, by the time I was done with seminary, though, I was I was kind of rethinking what kind of church I wanted to be part of. I'd been part of big churches. I'd been part of smaller, more family-oriented churches. And then I got really interested in the house church. So I did that for a couple years. And I spent four years in house church ministry. And by the time we were done with our fourth year, we had one child born, a second on the way. And I was seeing that no matter what model of church you do, there's strengths and there's weaknesses. And I was really looking for something that was small and intimate, like house church in my earliest church experience, but also something that valued strong Bible teaching, leadership, had some structure to it. And that's where I found the church in Leesburg 16 mm-hmm. years ago. I remember, you've told me this before, but a, a formative part of your college experience was mentorship, which is something Grace certainly values in Dr. Plaster, right? A mentor oh, yeah. for you. And how, how did that sort of shape your journey? So... The guy who encouraged me to come to Grace and said, you'll lose your salvation if you don't, um, he had been meeting with Dr. Plaster regularly. So he he was very persuasive. He was like, you need to meet with Dr. Plaster. So my freshman year, I was like, uh, some guy told me I need to meet with you. And he goes, oh, yeah, I'd love to do that. And uh, so we organized a, a weekly meeting. So I just show up to his office and we'd talk for a half hour to an hour. And he had a number of students that he did that with. And it was really so important for me because I was learning new things like I'm an introvert. I I was learning introvert versus extrovert. I was dealing with a lot of just like trying to understand the Bible better, and he had experience with that. And then relational dynamics as I started to date my wife and work through some of those tensions of being awkward and communication. All along the way, he was just very encouraging and spoke life into me, um, assured me that it's okay to be an introvert, that you and your wife, if you if you or not my wife, but uh, my girlfriend at the time, if you keep communicating and you lay that foundation, it's gonna it's gonna set you up for success. So some of those are have been big takeaways for me. And and he always had time for people, and I wanted to be the kind of person mm. who always had time for people. So that was formative for me. All of that. When you say that, uh, that is something I would. Uh say about you is that you make time for people. Uh, You do a good job of sort of balancing your introvert, extrovert, and having your time to be able to get, you know, sort of geared up for people, but you do a great job of engaging with people. And I'm one of the beneficiaries of that. And uh, you still are connected to the Plaster family, right? Yeah. His wife, Ginny, attends our church and she's been there. I, I couldn't give you the number of years, six or seven years. And, uh, I occasionally will interact with her, her adult children, they're around the area or once I'm missionary, and so we'll do Facebook messages. So, yeah, there's a connection there still. So but, s- but something else along those lines, someone that he mentored a- ended up coming to our church, and then I got to be a mentor to him. He's a pastor in Ohio now. Um, so I, it's, Shout out to Zach Hess, right? Yeah, Zach Hess. Uh-huh, so it's, it's, it's neat to have this, like, train of people who have— been in the shadow of Dave Plaster, followed in the footsteps, and 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 we all we say his name. And we're like, oh yeah, what a guy. Hmm. I'm sorry I never had the opportunity to interact with him, but I have enjoyed getting to know Jenny, his wife, for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 16 years at Leesburg Grace. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about you know maybe just a couple things that you're like. Here's here's some things that have been highlights or things that I have learned. You know, over this period of time of you know, 16 years at the same church is significant. Um, so what are some things that you've learned or some things that have been highlights for you? Yeah, I, well, I could tell you a couple of things. First of all, I love my church. I love the family feel. I love that when people gather together, they seem to want to be there. And there's an eagerness to serve at our church. We would be maybe typical of a smaller church where you feel like we never have quite enough leaders or never quite enough volunteers. But then I talk to people of bigger churches and they're like, we never have enough leaders or enough volunteers. But what I what I don't ever feel at our church is we don't have people who care. Like there's it's a community of care. Wow. And you see people coming alongside each other in lots of different ways to provide meals, to provide counsel, to even do house projects and those kind of things. I love that about our church. Um, One of the things that I've learned personally is that being in the same place for 16 years, you see a lot of people come and go, and that is a grief and a hardship. 
And um, I've had to work through a lot of those, like, oh, if this person leaves, is our church going to crumble? Like, early on, that's, like, really something that you experience as you get longer into your time at a church. You realize that different people have different needs. Different people have different seasons in life. Some people leave because they move away. Some people leave because they don't like your take on COVID, right? And there's all sorts of different, and you can't take those things personally. That's, that happens in any church. And you read through the letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, and he's naming names of people who have left. Mm. Uh, so I, I take comfort, and this has been a, a story of the church historic. It's not just something that happens to churches here today or in, in a consumer society or in smaller churches. So th- that's something I've learned. I've learned what I love to do and what I'm good at. I, I've learned what I'm terrible a- at. You know, that, that's not about my church as much as about me, but... Um, I'm terrible at outreach events. I'm not good with organization unless we're talking about my preaching calendar. I'm very organized with that. Uh, we've called our church the Island of Misfit Toys. Like, kind of anybody could come and find a place where they fit in. I didn't come up with that phrasing, but someone else did from the the um, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I do like that, though. Um, so I, th- I feel like those would be some characteristics of our church because we're smaller because uh, we we don't have like our necessarily like the thing that we're known for we try lots of different things some things work some things don't but that doesn't really get us down there's sort of an informality to it and it's okay to try stuff and for it to not work and it's yeah. not always having to be polished or perfect. Yeah, we're, we're definitely not a, a polished or perfect church. And and I, I do like that. I think there's something winsome about that. You're not coming for the show or the performance. Now, my preaching, I think, is going to come across as though I've thought about You've this prepared. in advance. Yes. And the people who do kids ministry and lead music, yes. they have practiced. We just not like... A plus, top notch. We have the best musicians. We have the best preachers. We have the best teachers in the world. We have eager, committed, loving, faithful volunteers. And honestly, at the end of the day, people who care and work hard, that mm. that matters a lot. Yeah, it should. Uh, so I want to get into a little bit of your dissertation. But first, I want to ask, because one of the things I've also appreciated about you is your engagement with the community. That's included grace. I mean, you've spoken in chapel, spoken to our faculty this year. Um, you have uh, you, you do work at the YMCA uh, with the Lincoln Lion. So to, has, when or how did that become a priority for you to really move beyond the four walls of your church into other contexts where you can develop relationships? Part of it's just as a, a dad who wants to be engaged in his kids' lives, like the school was a really easy entry point for me. I'd show up to some of the things that the school was doing, and they're always looking for volunteers. So I'm like, that's an easy win. And I love sports, and I love coaching. So for me, when the school was looking for coach, it's not like I'm I'm one of the parents who has to coach everything their kid does. But when I show up and there's not a coach or a need for coaches, and I like doing that, then mm-hmm. I'll say yes if the season's right. So so opportunities like that. And then some opportunities just came to me, like the YMCA, they were looking for vo- volunteer chaplains for their Livestrong program. And a connection I had through the schools said, hey, would you be interested in doing this? So it's always a matter of um, like, I want to be predisposed to say yes to those kind of opportunities, but talk to my wife, pray, and then say the yes that I was probably going to say anyway, right? Um, so I look for those kind of opportunities. I want it to line up with my gifting, and I don't want to feel busy. Mm-hmm. I want my schedule to be full. I want my life to be full. I want I want to live poured out, but I don't want to be busy. Mm-hmm. And so there are times, and I'm learning more and You'll more. you have to help this. me with that I, one, Tim. We talk well, about that sometimes, don't uh, we? you got to help me We with do. That and there's se- again, there are seasons yeah. in life or there are certain roles that you play where you just have to, you have to do a lot. Um, and, and you're probably in that season. And then you're responding to different situations that arise, and, and that makes life busy, not full. Um, but as much as you can, like, have those days off, have those things that you know you're going to say no to because you're not the right person or it's not the right timing for yeah. you. Um, so I look for where is my gifting, where do I have time and margin for that. The one other thing I would add to this is, and I just had a conversation because to timestamp this, it's missions conference at Grace. So one of the missionaries we support, we had lunch yesterday, and he was saying people aren't showing up to church for outreach events anymore. Um, I mean, they kind of do. Not at our church, though. Like, our church doesn't do outreach events well. They don't, they're don't. they not going to come, and we're not going to put on the best outreach event out there. But if our people are living as outreach, as missionaries, as ministers of reconciliation, if they're living that out on purpose, 
um, then that's going to be more effective for our church's outreach. If I'm not doing that as the pastor, then like, why am I going to call people to do that? Right. So I want to live that out and then encourage people in our church to do that or celebrate other places where folks in our church are doing that. As you know, my kids do uh, cross country as well. So I was able to see you at some of these cross country races and you don't have kids in the elementary program currently. Um, and one of the things I just loved is uh, your passion. I mean, you were you were the coach who's like running around the course, making sure all of your athletes at some point see you, whether they're in first place or they're in last place, that they see you and you're encouraging them. And you get as much of a workout, I think, as any of the uh, as any of the kids do, because you're just like all over the place. Yeah, I I love that about cross country, and I see you at the races too. You're running to the different spots. Yeah, too. but I'm like the focused on my get, kids, yeah. you know. The, yeah, but well, and at that age, honestly, I want kids to love the sport. So I just want to like I want to run and shout encouragement to these yeah, students. Yeah. If I was coaching at the middle school or high school level, my philosophy or approach would be a little bit different. I'd still try to get in lots of different locations, but man, I want these kids to love running because you can do it most of your life. And so it is a lot of fun to go to those. We, I mean, here in the Warsaw, Winona Lake area, we have elementary cross country. It's amazing. <laughs> Where else do you find that? Yeah. So I want, that's one th- something I would definitely say yes to. It's been a blessing to our family. And you have run some cross country camps for the community that my kids have been a part of. And just you've really used that passion as a gifting to, to share and show Jesus to others. Okay, so um, congregational formation through sharing testimonies. Uh, so first of all, like, why did that become your dissertation topic? Just sharing testimonies and, and how that is formative for congregations. I've always loved stories. So something like Grace Story Podcast, we're telling people stories, but it's the larger story of grace, which is the part of the story of God. Like yeah. all of that, all of that is the reason for it. Um, I think people connect to stories. And I think everybody who shows up to a worship service on a Sunday morning, God is telling a story through their lives. And so testimony is how do you give people the opportunity to tell the stories where God shows up? It's a lost art. It's something that's not happening as much as it used to because we do like to kind of control the timing and the schedule in church, and we get nervous about those vulnerable moments where we hand the mic off and things go sideways, right? (laughs) We've probably seen those moments. But So for me, ever since I, I started at Leesburg Grace, I wanted to not just be the one doing the talking, but the one who was championing stories and or narrating other people's stories and finding out what's God doing in your life and how can we share that story. So that's that was kind of the genesis of the topic. I've always loved stories. I know God's telling a story through every single life in our congregation. And I wanted to try to figure out how do you make that a practice? Because there's a lot of practices, and you hear a lot about practice in the Christian life right now. Um, solitude, silence prayer, Bible study. And a lot of these things can be very individualized. Mm -hmm. What makes Sunday morning more like a practice? And so testimony is one of those Sunday morning practices that's a little bit different than corporate singing, that's a little bit different than listening to a sermon as far as exposing people to the congregation, doing, providing opportunities for self-reflection, or even um, opportunities for vulnerability. And all of those things happen, self-disclosure, with the testimony that don't happen when we just gather together and sing or don't happen when I preach. I mean, I get to do some of that. I get to share stories about my life. But testimony brings a lot of those pieces together, and I really I liked that it did that. So your focus, you know, is somewhat uh, – well, I think of two things. One is the church. Mm-hmm. So was there sort of, um, you know, a study of, of the Bible and, and how it's – its use of story and then how that applies in the church. And then I think of individual individuals and sort of coaching and helping them be able to share a gospel-centered, Christ-centered testimony or story. I mean, yeah. can you kind of talk about those two things? Sort of. Yeah, let me do the, f- the, the church and the person. Let me do the second one first. Okay. I don't know how many times any of us have shown up to a small group meeting, or you even get together with someone from your church for coffee or accountability or another believer, and you spend the whole time recapping the weekend of sports, how your fantasy team did, what the weather was like, oh, a short update about your family. And let's pray. And yeah, and you're like, wait, was God in the midst of any of this kind of stuff? It's like, shouldn't we 
people who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, who have the mind of Christ, be able to talk about these kind of things? Like, what's God doing in our lives? So part of it was, like, frustration. And then there was a little sensitivity that came after that. You know, first I was upset, and then I was like, let me be sensitive. Like, maybe we haven't coached people on how to pay attention to where God shows up in our lives. Like, we know he answers prayers. We know he communicates through Scripture. But are there other ways to help people pay attention to God's work in their lives. And so part of it was I want to just help people think through that because I, I'm, I'm at adamant in the belief that God's working in your life, Drew, my life, everybody in this room right now for the recording, everybody who attends Grace, everybody who shows up in our churches. So help us pay attention, and if you pay attention, then can you articulate it? And so testimony is giving individuals the opportunity, the eyes to see, and then the mouth to speak. And I wanted to develop that practice for people. So I had to do the research and try to figure out, okay, am I doing this well? Um, Can I help other people do this well? The second part is the question about the church. And can you just ask that again? Well, uh, before we go there, I want to ask a quick quick question. So one is like, hey, uh, help people be able to observe where God is working in their lives. And then the second part is being able to then share that. Mm -hmm. And and is there sort of a, a rubric or a pattern or... Um, you know, if you were to give a practical application for like, n- next time you get called upon to give a testimony, here's a way to think about how to actually outline or, you know, it can be spontaneous. And sometimes that's like, you're sort of all over the place. Yeah. Is there is there a helpful sort of, you know, way of sharing testimony that is either outlined in scripture or just outlined in church history, whatever it may be? Yeah. Um, Well, the one from Scripture that I love is when Jesus talks with this Samaritan woman, the woman at the well, and when she gets done with her encounter with Jesus, and then she goes back and tells the town people, who don't seem put off by her at all, which makes you wonder, was she really like this horrible, unclean, sexually improper woman, right? Because they all listen to her testimony. And she goes, I just met a man who knew everything about me. Like, she had this encounter with Jesus, and then she summarizes it with, I just met somebody who just, he knew me in a special way, right? Um, So I love that testimony phrase of hers. And then everybody from the town comes to talk with Jesus based on her testimony. She becomes, like, the greatest evangelist in her community. (laughs) But her testimony was this, like, I just talked to a guy, and, like, something happened in that conversation. I felt known. I felt seen. I felt heard. I felt loved. Um, so that's not that's one from Scripture. That's a good example from John four. What I did with my dissertation was I just tried to come up with because I'm a pastor. So how do you make it memorable? I came up with an acronym. You see these GPS markers all over the place. Like I log into my bank app, and then if I want to find out where I can locate an ATM machine, it will literally have the word locate underneath that symbol of a GPS marker. So I thought that could be an acronym for locating God in everyday life. So locate would be L, lesson. What is a lesson God is teaching you? O, opportunity. What is an opportunity God has provided for you? Or so what's an open door? What's a closed door? Um, C, what's a challenge that God has brought into your life and how is he helping you through it? A, what are you asking God about? How is he answering you? So that that comes to the prayer. T, teaching. What is God teaching you? That's specifically through scripture or maybe a sermon or a, a book, like a Christian living book. A lesson is like a life lesson, and then teaching is more related to like the scriptures. Mm-hmm. And then E would be echo, the idea of a sacred echo. This is a theme that keeps coming up in your life, and as this theme keeps coming up in your life, you realize that's God bringing that up in your life. So Mm -hmm. that's the tool I would give to people in in our church, or I've spoken at a couple different places, and then it's outlined in my dissertation is locate, lesson, opportunity, challenge, ask, teaching, and echo. Way to remember, like, what's in your dissertation. I'm not sure I could remember (laughs) what's in mine and be able to share, but that's a helpful way to think of, that's not necessarily, those are all the ways you could share a testimony. So you know, you, you've provided a great, like, hey, if you can't think of this, I mean, there's not a thing, right? There's multiple ways. Yeah. All right, so now within the context of the local church, how does how does a pastor, um, how does it create, you know, um, places where testimony can be 
engaged and shared. Yeah, pastors do this fairly naturally. Like a lot of times people will do this before a baptism service. You let people share their salvation story, which is a kind of testimony, but it's not your only testimony. And so people will share who they were before Christ, who they are becoming now that they are following Christ, what was that critical moment where they made the decision. Perfect opportunity. If you're preaching on a particular topic, maybe it's about suffering or pain or depression, and you have someone in your church and you've heard a story from them about how God's helped them through depression or a particular kind of suffering, whether they're in the middle of it or they've come out of it, then you can invite them to share a testimony. Now, I would make the argument that recording something, putting a neat soundtrack behind it, and making sure that it's 30 seconds or less, that's not a real testimony. That's a cool video uh, clip that you've put together, but testimony is spoken aloud. It's Mm. actually shared live, and that's what people appreciate because it's vulnerable. If it is by video, it's controlled, and people know they can be manipulated. If you're sharing it live, then you're actually being a living witness in that moment, giving a real-time interpretation of the experience that you had, and people are really interacting with it that way. So I'm, I'm going to make a distinction between like a cool video that's testimonial versus like a testimony mm. in church. So you would actually get that person up front and have them I share. I think of like a testimonial of like, you know, your review on Google. Or, right. You know, like it's a, yeah, it's just a short little, um, as opposed to a testimony being sort of live and real. Yeah, yeah. So even this, there's a testimonial element to any Grace Story podcast that you do, but it's not, it's, it's a testimony to you and me right now, but it's not a testimony in the purest sense because people will listen to a recording. Mm of it. Uh, Other ways that you can integrate it into a worship service, what what I did for the project, and then what I did again this year, is I have a month where we're going to have testimonies every single Sunday, and I do it two different ways. Um, So I, I let people know in advance, hey, for September, we're doing testimonies, and I'll give people some prompts for it, be thinking about what God's been doing in your life and if you want to share. And then I will always ask people directly in advance, would you be willing to share a testimony and often give them a prompt about this? I don't do you vet, give them a time limit too? Or I how, say three, how I say three to five okay. minutes. I don't ask for it written in advance. I don't have them practice on me. I do want it to feel real. I want it to feel live. Um, and then I do one risky thing. At the end of the month, we're just going to do open mic testimonies. And we do it usually at the close of the service, and I know there's only 10 minutes left, so I, I know I can cut it off at some point, right? But you never know who's going to come up at that. Is the Spirit of God going to work, or is that flaming extrovert or expressive person going to jump at the chance to talk in front of the mic? And you never know what's going to happen. But what I found, and this was through the research and through interviews with people, anecdotal evidence, was that people really appreciated that it wasn't always the most eloquent or likely person who came up front and shared because it said anybody could do this. Mm. It didn't have to be the seminary-trained person who shared or the person who's been in the church for 30 years and is an elder who shared. It, we, we had a testimony from someone who'd been in our church for less than a year and just came up and shared something, yeah. and that meant a lot to people. You know, I think of uh, Craig Rochelle often says, um, people connect with those who are real, not those who are right. And that it provides a realness. You know, the sermon is usually right. Like I've, I've, pursed, all, I've pursed all the text and looked at the Greek and the Hebrew and, you know, and, and I'm explaining it. And, and that's good and it's it's helpful, but the testimony provides kind of a realness to it. Um, yeah. A, a, a story to go along um, with the text. That's really good. And then, of course, that can be done, right? Small group contexts. Uh, there's other contexts in the ch- church where you can provide opportunity for testimony. Yeah, we've brought it into men's ministry. A lot of times we'll say, hey, you know, share, share a way you've, you've located God recently, and I'll go through that prompt. Yeah. And it works well in those kind of situations. Also, panel discussions, I think, are a form of testimony that work really well, because then you can ask two or three people a set of questions, and you're getting exposure to lots of folks from your congregation. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Appreciate yep. you kind of giving us the, uh, and I appreciate how you've, you've shared some of this on our campus with our faculty and staff and with our students, uh, the value of, of story. And we all have one and God is continuing to work in our lives and provide story. And thank you for being a part of my story. Um, you've been 
coming alongside me for really ever since this presidency thing started and and been somebody who's uh, been an accountability partner and uh, someone who's allowed me just to share and shared back and and do life with. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate it too. Where uh, where can people find more about Tim Sprankle, things you've written, find you, follow you, whatever it may be? Yeah, just come to Leesburg Grace on a Sunday morning. Uh, <laughs> there are a couple commentaries that are on uh, Amazon that you could purchase. My name's the second name on the list, and that would only be for people who are preaching or teaching through those books. So I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. But yeah, come on come Sunday visit the church. morning. There you go. Right? Or our, our church's website is graceintheburg.com. I like it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tim, for sharing today, and thank you for listening to the Grace Story podcast. Thanks to Rick and Avery for their work in producing the podcast. And of course, if you can like, comment, subscribe, share it wherever you got this podcast from, we would be so grateful. Questions, comments you'd like to share with us, feel free to email those to podcast at grace.edu. Until next time, live your best Grace Story today. 